you. All right, so one of the things as I was starting to talk about was that we um, spend a lot of time and energy on World Migratory Bird Day because it's an opportunity for us to reach a lot of different audiences and to really um, con focus and concentrate on conservation issues that are important for birds and their conservation. And this is a celebration of the uh, bird migration phenomena and it allows us to really have a call to action so that we can protect birds, protect their habitats, and work together to uh, think about the conservation of birds on a small scale, regional scale, national scale, and a global scale. So um, it's a lot of fun. And if you haven't attended a World Migratory Bird Day Festival in your area, you could help organize one, or you could join one, or you could, um, you know, figure out what is it possible maybe in a local school or university or nature center, you know, maybe they might be willing to host a, a World Migratory Bird Day. And World Migratory Bird Day, while we say bird day, um, it, it happens whenever the birds are migrating. And so we have events, particularly in the spring, as birds are migrating back into North America. And then as they migrate south in the Southern Hemisphere, we have um, World Migratory Bird Day in a lot of places in October. So pretty much up to how, you know, how organizers want to do that. But it's a fabulous way to engage with people. We also do a lot of things related to partners who are working on projects. And Western Herming, Hummingbird Partnership is just one example of a collaborative effort throughout North America to really think about how can we motivate people to focus on hummingbirds and the conservation of hummingbirds. And so that means research um, support and thinking about what really threatens and what benefits hummingbirds. So raising that awareness through training and outreach and getting people engaged is just one of the many important partnerships that we do. We um, want you to have fun going shopping. So you can come shopping on the environmentfortheamericas.org website. Lots of cool things, cool glasses, cool scarves, jewelry, coffee, all sorts of things that are um, supporting us as well as making a statement. We have um, educational materials. Some of our educational materials are free. Some of them are downloadable. Some of them you can use for schools or churches or however you want to get the word out. And then it, I carry bird stickers with me everywhere I go. And when I see kids, you know, sometimes when I'm traveling, kids are a little grumpy. Sometimes businessmen are a little grumpy when I travel, but I always have stickers with me so that I can share stickers with, with, um, with kids and or adults. So we really want you to be our friend, to share your experiences with Environment for the Americas and all the cool things that we do with your friends, and we want you to stay in touch. So please follow us on our social media feeds, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, you can go to our website, find all of the ways that you can interact with us. You can talk to us, ask us questions, and um, learn more about what Environment for the Americas is all about. And I want to share with you, I'm not advancing to my next slide, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Let's see. Next slide. There we go. Our next bird book club is The Wise Hours. I bought by Miriam Darlington. And um, it's a little different than our normal monthly bird book club because it's gonna be held during the daytime. So depending on where you're calling from or joining us from, it'll be anywhere from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and so this is just to be able to have Miriam on with us because she's in a whole totally different time zone than we are. So I hope that you register for that, read that book, and join us next month on July 27th. In the meanwhile, for tonight, um, this, this um, book, I am just excited about it. As a previous bird rehabilitator, I sure could have used this book um, when I was actively rehabilitating birds. So I'm real excited. I was real excited to read through it and look at her fabulous illustrations as well as some of the photographs 
And um, so tonight joining us is Linda Tuttle Adams, and she is the author of Baby Bird Identification, A North American Guide. And so let me, Linda, I'm going to get out of this. And oh, you're seeing my messy desktop. All right. So again, folks, feel free to join us um, on the camera if you'd like. And Linda, thank you again for joining us. I would love for you to, um, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? How did you um, get involved in the field that you're in? Just give us a little background about yourself. Okay. Well, I live in Rough and Ready, California. <laughs> and that's near Grass Valley, which is about an hour north of Sacramento. So I'm in the Sierra Foothills. And I have about, oh, maybe over 50 species of birds that nest in my own backyard. So I have horses and we've rescued dogs. I have three education ravens, um, which are a classic example of telling people why you don't want wild birds as pets, because they are the worst to have in captivity. <laughs> um, but I also am a biologist. Uh, I graduated from UC Santa Cruz years and years ago. And my um, Forte was bird behavior, mammal behavior. Um, I've always drawn birds and horses together. So I actually have a business called Horse Feathers Art. So they kind of go together. Um, and I got this, I've been a wildlife rehabilitator for um, going on 18 years. I'm taking a break because we are thinking of moving closer to my grandchildren. I have one grandchild, another on the way in August, and another on the way in September. And they all live in the Sacramento area. So um, we're about an hour away. And I just, my life is going that way. Plus, I love doing this and um, sending books to people and working online, identifying baby birds that people find and getting help so they can get to a rehabilitator. So back in the day when I started in 2008 in wildlife rehabilitation, as a biologist, I thought I could bring a lot of information to help, but I knew nothing about wildlife rehab. And um, so I had to learn all the veterinary aspects of it. But one thing that I found frustrating was we didn't know what we were, what we were feeding. We didn't know what kind of bird it was most of the time. And you spent hours looking online, which at photos, which are terrible. And so I always tell people, you have to start at the beginning. Do not start comparing photos because you'll go off the track real quickly. You know, yellow is a good example. Oh, it's got to be a goldfinch when it's actually an oriole or some, because they didn't look at the beak. They didn't look at the feet. They didn't look at the size of the bird. They didn't weigh the bird. So um, I teach I teach a step-by-step -step process in the book for a beginner person who may not even know anything about the backyard birds that they have. Um, and when I say backyard, it's where we go hiking. It's in you in your backyard. My I live on 20 acres, so it's a big backyard. Um, and wherever you may go and encounter baby birds. So you start with the most common, and then you kind of um, when you come across something unusual, then it's a, a big challenge. So I got the idea of the book. It started as a chart, like a 50-page chart of mouth colors. And I classified birds according to the mouth colors that they were. Uh, but then it didn't have enough information. It wasn't teaching people how to ID, which is really hard. It's not like adult birds because often the baby birds don't look anything like their parents. They might have a little hint of, you know, maybe like their bluebirds have blue in the wings. Um, so do your scrub jays and other colorful more colorful birds but if you're looking at new world sparrows or warblers you've got a big challenges so i address all that in this and my the way that i uh, kind of i guess warblers are probably the most difficult they're the most variable of all the species so you, they in fact their mouth colors range from yellow to pink whereas corvids are all pink or red um, but the warblers are the most challenging because they go through also two molts before they leave their nest or shortly after. 
So they, they trick you into thinking. Even the easiest ones, like a yellow rump warbler, it's gray. And then it starts getting the little yellow rump later on. But um, so, OK, so my background, um, yeah, wildlife rehabilitator, rehabilitate everything from raptors to water birds, herons, songbirds, the tiniest hummingbird, everything. And, um, and this is my forte now. I have a niche that I finally have settled into and uh, wrote this book that took years, but three years concentrated and I will never do it again. I probably won't update. <laughs> no one else has done anything like this. Um, it's crazy when you illustrate your own book that you wrote. So yeah, I think, did I cover everything? And I'm married, my <laughs> husband is on his way home. <laughs> and your daughter called you just as we were starting. <laughs> um, thank you for that kind of um, broad background. And, and I'm, I'm, we're thrilled to have you here and folks, if you have questions um, for Linda as we go through this conversation, please put them in the chat and I'll call on you. You can either unmute yourself and come off, you know, come onto the camera and ask Linda yourself, or I'm happy to ask it for you. So just let me know which you want to do. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll call on you and then we'll, we'll take them from there. Um, so Linda, as I mentioned, I have done re, uh, bird rehabilitation. And when you were saying that you, um, you know, were kind of taking a little bit of a break, I couldn't even imagine being a bird rehabilitator and writing a book at the same time and doing much of anything else because it's time consuming when you, especially when you, when you have a lot and once you're known as a rehabilitator, then, you know, and especially you know, I was thinking about you this this time of year when we get so many questions from people about they found a baby bird or, you know, they have a, a baby bird and, you know, what do I do? And so I, I want to come back to that. But um, I want to share a story with you just to illustrate a point that you brought up earlier. And it's not a it's um, you can you can find holes in my story totally. But as a, as a rehabilitator, there, a group of us were chatting about rehabilitation and this, this rehabilitator said, oh, somebody called me the other day and they had a black and white bird with a long bill and strong feet and they, they, it was, something was wrong with it and it was not um, doing very well. And the way that they described it caused the rehabilitator to think that it, um, was a was a loon just you know the black and white the long bill the strong you know the the feet and the rehabilitator said well why don't you do this why don't you put water in your bathtub and put the bird in the water in your bathtub until i can get there and so the rehabilitator arrived to find a downy woodpecker in the bathtub yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and so that made me think oh. that story, you know, from years ago. And I don't know how wow. how accurate that particular story was. I think it might might have been more of a of a point. Oh, I'm thinking. sure it was true. <laughs> I'm sure, as you know, we have, you know, the so size gives people trouble. It's you show up and it's they. I have an eagle and it's a pigeon and just people have no clue so i if it's not accurate it's great it's true somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing i say is look at the beak but look at the feet because right away they would have said oh it's not webbed feet or it does or it's got three toes or the loon would have had webbed feet um you gotta look at the feet and yep. two toes forward, two toes back, woodpecker. But <laughs> as a rehabber, I would never even tell them to put a water, any kind of bird in water, even if it was a duck. Don't put yeah. it in water. Yeah, and that's why I said I don't know how accurate that story is because you're right. I would never tell somebody to yeah. put a bird in water. <laughs> so um, yeah. I'm I'm curious, um, Linda, as you were, you know, you've got a lot of, and for folks that join us on a regular basis. You all know that, you know, I have these little sticky notes that I put in various places in the book. I don't know if you can actually see them, but I have all of these places where I find really cool things in the in the books and um, 
and like to draw attention to them. I'm, I am really curious, for those of you that have joined us this evening, are any of you out there rehabilitators? You can um, put it in the chat if you'd like to, or you can raise your, your, you know, wave at us or raise your hand or something. Rehabilitators joining us tonight just to see who our audience is. Do we have some rehabilitators? Elise said she does. Raptors, orphan care, pastorines, raptor. Ah, we have a one day I will. Boy, this will be a great <laughs> resource for you when that one day comes. So um, tell us a little bit about, you know, you said that you were long-term rehabilitator and that you um, were kind of creating a chart and you needed this. What was your what was your thought process when you decided to to actually do the book? It, it, did you just like, that's it, I'm doing a book? Well, for one thing, um, if you're a home rehabilitator, you don't have time to do a lot of research. And, you, you know, um, fortunately, there are Facebook groups now that help people identify birds. Even people that have gotten my book have looked up something, but it doesn't quite maybe make sense because, you know, as I say, every, you could never have a book that has every stage of life of a baby bird in it. It would be, you know, volumes thick. And so you can't have every perfect picture and illustrations or photographs are just a moment in time in that baby bird's life that will, if it's a songbird, it's hatches and it's flying away. And 10 to 15 days at the most. So it changes by the hour. Um, you know, cuckoos, for example, will be what in the morning, they'll have all their pin feathers. And by that afternoon, they're all fluff. Everything, they, they just all, they molt out all at one time and then they run out of their nest. They don't fly. So, uh, and they're not songbirds, of course, but I, I think to me, the most important thing was help having something in hand that somebody could just quickly look up and at least know what family the bird belonged to in because that's where you start you don't start looking at species unless you know automatically oh that is um, a house sparrow or i have house finches nesting on my porch and one fell out so you know it's a finch um, but but the most important thing is to get to the family and for a rehabilitator most birds in that family is they're going to have the same diet so to keep it simple i tell everybody if you get a baby bird and um and you don't know what to feed it first of all you're not really supposed to feed it if you're a member of the public because of the glottis you know stuck putting water down in the mouth and, and then they'll aspirate and die um, but if they have to have it overnight a baby bird does need to eat so bugs they can eat bugs, you can chop them up or, um, and little drops of water under the beak. But if it's a finch, the finches are the only granivores, true granivores from the minute they hatch. They get little seeds in their crop that hours, just even an hour after hatching, they have mom and dad have already fed them seeds. So if you know your finches and you know it's a finch, then you know um, what to feed it there. But if it's if it's not a finch, then you know to feed it bugs. And that's probably 95% of all the rest of the species. Uh, so anyway, this is supposed to be a quick, handy reference that you could carry around in the field if you're not a rehabilitator um, and read about uh, the descriptions. It's full of descriptions that I go through the nestling and the fledgling description. And if it's not a, if it's a precocial chick, then um, I call it a chick. And it's described maybe a couple of stages that it goes through. Um, so it, it, can, it can really be helpful for anybody. It's, it's basically, if you skip steps and you try to just go right to what it might be, you're, like I said earlier, you're gonna go down the wrong track and, and misidentify a bird. So you, in addition to this fabulous book that you've written, and you drew all of these pictures, right? Yes. They're, mm -hmm. These are yours. Yes. yes. So and water, drew them and water painted watercolor. They're all watercolors. Fabulous. And there's a few photographs. So yeah. in addition to the, the book, and 
you have a we, you have a, a website, a companion website, and then you also have a Facebook page. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, and I think Susan, were you going to bring that up to share the what that looks like for folks? Yeah, I was actually just sharing the bird art. I don't know if anybody can oh. can you see that because it's so beautiful. That's one of my favorite pages. <laughs> Yeah, I just I love, love the way you've little, done yeah. the different positions and the face and yeah. it's just incredible. Yeah. And then, yes, I can share with you. Yeah, so if you're a rehabilitator or you're in a situation where this information might be helpful, uh, Linda's done a great job of kind of the companion of, of the book. And... Uh, um, Linda, you you mentioned um, one of the things I think sometimes people are often not sure about or a little confused about the the laws related to birds and being able to keep birds and you know can you review that a little bit for us? Yeah, so wildlife rehabilitators have uh, federal permit and state permits, and. Um, it varies by state what the requirements are to have birds and you know, to be able to rehabilitate birds. And um, in California, we probably have the most lax uh, regulations as far as the training involved. And um, so I feel like what um, home rehabilitators really need a lot of support. Because, you know, we all have pets and things like that. And wild birds should never be exposed to domesticated animals or domestic noises. Because what people don't understand is that a bird is just not a bird brain. It, they have a high capacity of learning. And it, we've been very surprised at, at some birds that we thought were just itty bitty, teensy weensy brains. But the thing about birds is they have more neurons in a smaller space. So they have a great memory for things. The corvids, for example, and chickadees that hide their seeds, they cache their food, they remember every spot that they put it in. So, um, but they learn throughout uh, certain stages of their life. And the very beginning, the imprinting part, they have to learn who they are, that's filial imprinting. And then they learn um, who their mate is gonna be. They imprint on their habitat. They imprint on the stars, like buntings they have to see stars before they migrate, although never learn to migrate. Um, Larger head shrikes must have branches with spikes on them in captivity so they can practice snagging their prey. Otherwise, they won't learn it. And there's a certain time frame that you can do that. Otherwise, after that, it's like too late. Song learning, huge. Um, anyway, I forgot your initial question. I always go off on these <laughs> tangents. Um, I oh, love the, listening to you, though, Linda. <laughs> yeah, so regulations, yeah. <laughs> um, and the training involved. Yeah. So the members of the public can keep uh, a bird for really 24 hours uh, or and veterinarians, maybe 48 hours, but they're not even allowed to keep them and rehab them. Um, they need, to, people need to turn the birds over right away as soon as they can. And sometimes there are volunteers that will meet people halfway. Um, I try to guide people through, through that live out on farms that don't know how to help a baby bird overnight, keep it warm, give them those tips, you know, that's, that's, um, otherwise it's a waste of time to try to get it to a rehabilitator, it's too late. So yeah, the regulations, um, but I, I don't know too many people who have been um, arrested for <laughs> any of this. I mean, somebody has to turn them in and, you know, officers are busy, so anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think sometimes people are a little confused about, you know, what am I allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do? And especially this time of year in spring, well, you know, just in spring in general, depending on where your area is, you know, people often feel like they have to help the bird. Like, you know, how do I, how do I help that bird? Oh my gosh, it needs help. And sometimes it doesn't need help. Sometimes it's just fledged and the mama bird is someplace close by and keeping a watchful eye. Um, so it's really important that, you know, when, when, it, when needed, that people like you rehabilitators are able to, um, 
you know, to step in and, and, and help. And like you said, there's a short window of time that you can have the bird and transport it to somebody who can legally take care of it and knowledgeably. So we have a question in the chat, Linda, that's related to baby brown, a baby brown headed cowbird. Do you, uh, they're Yay. asking, how do you care for a baby? <laughs> So um, brown-headed cowbirds are quite interesting because they are a brood parasite, which means that the female lays eggs in another bird's nest and she lets the host species raise her own baby. So a lot of people think that the cowbird kicks out the, the young of the nest and, it's, and it doesn't do that. Cuckoos, our North American cuckoos don't even do that. But what happens is the cowbird is so big, it's usually bigger and it can reach up further so it gets more food so the other ones may starve. But sometimes they all, you know, it's not always that the only bird that survives is the cowbird. So how does a cowbird know that it's a cowbird? Because every bird imprints as far as we know, must see its own parents. So how does a cowbird know? Well, scientists have studied this and um, they have uh, the pair, the mother bird sticks around, and when the when the nestling cowbird's old enough, it sneaks out at night and it goes out into the field and it sees all the other cowbirds out there. So it learns, it hears the mother calling, and the father. And when it hears that, some kind of an enzyme is kicked off in the brain to help it understand its identity, so that it doesn't imprint on um, the bird host that it's with. And, um, and there's other fascinating things about cowbirds, but how to raise them. So I recommend, because it's all new, is that you need to play that cowbird song. You can download cowbird, uh, you can download, you know, songs, Cornell site, all about birds. Um, there's a, another couple of sites. Just get the cowbird sound going for it. And then I am really um, a proponent of putting a picture of the adult bird in with the bird. Now you can have a cowbird, they're great buddies with other birds, but you need a picture. So each species you have that you buddy together sees itself and goes, that's right, that's who I am. I'm not gonna be a cowbird like the buddy I've got with it, you know? Um, so have mirrors, have the cowbird adults, and um, it needs to be released back exactly where it, you came from because we don't want to introduce a parasite, a brood parasite into a territory that it doesn't normally um, live. And then when it goes back to its own territory, there may still be the flock there that it can join. Did that completely answer the question? So Liz, and I'm not sure that I'm saying her name right, she is a rehabilitator. So um, rehabilitates a, a variety of, um, I think, raptors, uh, passerines, and um, yeah. orphan care. So Liz, did that, I'm not sure I'm saying Liz right, but did that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you for that. Okay. So we've got a couple other questions. Let me go through these. Um, let's see. Why do you think an ID for baby birds has not been developed before, um, aside from the difficulty level? So your book is one of a first. Okay. I mean, there's a couple other books out there that talk about baby birds, but nothing, nothing like this. Nothing is extensive. Well, um, it's it was very labor intensive and nobody has the time to do this. So. Over the years, I, I don't think anybody has collected probably as many folks. I'm a, well, first of all, I'm a data freak. I'm a research Nazi. So those two things, I love data and I love research. And that's a biologist part of me. So if I don't understand something or I don't, I always look it up and I go to a scientific source. You know, a lot of online stuff is just garbage. So I, I'll download a paper and I've collected papers over, over 30, 40 years now, collected photos, studied. Um, I've studied in the field as well. I went to South America and studied for two and a half months, rare, strange birds with an ornithologist. 
And so I, I know how birds function in the wild, and I know the importance of getting them back out there to so they can go on their ancestral path, that we don't mess with their brains um, by teaching them something wrong in rehab. And so um, no one has done a book like this because uh, the closest one probably was Peter Pyle's molting strategies, but he studied birds in museums, dead, dead birds, you know, wrote, I did too. I went to the museum and any bird I didn't have a picture of, or there wasn't any information, I went to Berkeley and Cal, Cal Academy of Sciences where in San Francisco, where I worked for six years and took out birds in jars, found some unique things that weren't even in the literature and it's in my book. And it's just like, like the burden, they're naked when they hatch, but they have crown feathers, really long uh, red crown feathers. And it's not in the literature anywhere. And I go, I found something new. So it's really exciting. Yeah, it, it's totally. Um, so the, the difficulty, you know, I, I, this was extremely, extremely difficult, but had I not had all that research and not all the photos and already the, the pre-step and had been a painter. And as I painted baby birds, I even learned more because you have to study them up close. Like, where is that eye line? Is, and at what age does the eye line show up? Like in Beewood's rent, it doesn't show up immediately and they get it later and same thing in Carolina Wren. So, um, but you can see if you look really close magnifying glass sometimes you have to be the the um, detective with your little magnifying glass looking at things. So um, I don't think ever, anyone's ever gonna try this. Why would they want to? Oh, the other closest was Birds uh, by John Basich um, and his partner, the eggs, nests and young of North America, but they had only three pages on songbirds. So he actually wrote um, a very glamorous um, uh, uh, on the back of the book. I forget what you call it. And he wrote a, um, and he has a newsletter as well. So that book is why write something about nests and eggs of baby birds when it's already in another book. So this was just the baby birds themselves. Well, it's fascinating. Paul Basage um, is, uh, how do I say this? He doesn't hand out compliments very easily, <laughs> but he said just I heard that. <laughs> so um, if you haven't read the book or looked at the book, um, you know, or if you have anything to do with birds, you do want to have this on your shelf. I'm just going to read what Paul says about the um, about this book. So a groundbreaking must read for wild rehabilitators, field ornithologists and curious birders. Linda Tuttle Adams' masterpiece ex expertly takes on a set of previously neglected topics to make a singular contribution to the identification, anatomy, and development of young birds. And so um, I know Paul well. So that bravo to you. You got it. You got yeah, his A plus. I was um, so honored. I mean, I was really honored. <laughs> Yeah. So, and he does have that. He does uh, put out a an e newsletter on a regular basis, just updating about stuff related to birds and their their conservation. Um, so, Linda, we have another question in here that um, somebody has replied. Ooh, good question. So, um, Michelle is asking, do and this is this is a a question, a difficult question, I think. Do you think invasive birds should be rehabilitated? Um, I think in certain areas, invasive birds are have created a stronger impact. For example, in my area, house sparrows and starlings are really not a problem. Um, there's a balance that seems to be pretty good here. Uh, they are really detrimental in other areas and especially for uh, rare birds or, you know, because cavity nests are like 
luxury. They're, they're so rare and um, they're a commodity. And so they're competed for by both starlings and house sparrows. Um, and the rock pigeons also carry a lot of diseases. When you get one in, they're usually it's because they've got trick and they've got other things. So um, I, I believe in all life. Um, however, if you're a home rehabilitator and you only have, you can only do 10 birds and you have to make a choice, then you have to say no to the species that are plentiful and um, you have to set limits. So each organization has their own rules about this. Some don't take them and some do. Um, so my personal feeling on it, I have, I got a baby house sparrow just hatched. A, a mom and a boy, her young boy came and had brought it in his hand and she brought it to our center. And I was the intake director at that time. And we didn't refuse anything, um, but she, he, he was just wanting us to take care of it. And they were so relieved and so happy and they gave us a hundred dollars. And so when you turn away the public, they don't understand. And that's a bad message to say, well, we don't take them or um, it's a difficult message. And it's always met with people who don't really understand that this little living life is going to grow up and um, kill other bluebird babies because it wants their nest. They don't understand that right now. It's a wiggling little warm body that they have. And so, you know, my heart, I love baby birds. I don't care what it is. Um, I have rehabbed all of them because I wanted the experience of how to do it. But I direct people, there's some wonderful sites on how to care for sparrows, house sparrows. And we need to distinguish the house sparrow from the new world sparrows because they're not even closely related. Um, but I direct them to those sites and I say, they're very easy to raise and it's not illegal. Uh, so I hope that answered my question. I, I just, I, yeah, I've never euthanized any bird because it wasn't, um, because it couldn't help what it was being born into. <laughs> uh, it's a tough yeah. one. Thank you for that. That's, that is, a, it's a difficult question. It's a difficult, sometimes a difficult conversation and people have different thoughts and opinions about, you know, what they think should be done. And, and some people, Linda, um, you know, don't even know that there's a difference between, you know, native birds and non-native birds or invasive birds or, you know, um, yeah. why would you look at them differently? So, so that is, that is a tough one. Thanks. Thanks for that question, um, Michelle. So we have another yeah. question and a comment and just for the thread of what you're talking about, um, Liz, who is a rehabilitator uh, is I think from Oregon, but she talks about Western bluebird monitoring and not protecting the invasive house sparrow. So a lot of people, when they are monitoring nesting boxes, they will kick out um, an invasive species, you know, because and and different laws. So the federal law does not protect um, invasive species like the European starling or the um, house sparrow. But some cities um, have ordinances that will protect them. So you have to kind of know where you're living as to what the what the laws are. So while the federal typically trumps, um, you know, there are sometimes, you know, city ordinances or laws at a more local level that um, that will protect those birds. So one of the other questions, a fun question. And as I look at this book, um, for you've got a huge section in here. I was reading through this and I'm like, where are the pictures? And I was particularly interested. We had some sandhill cranes in our neighbor walking around our neighborhood. They had, they laid eggs, two, two um, hatchlings came out of those eggs. And I'm looking for what's Linda say about cranes? Not that I would ever want to rehabilitate cranes, but they're just so darn cute. And I found your baby crane illustrator, your sandhill crane illustration in your book. But um, Susan, Suzanne is actually asking, how is painting baby birds different from painting other birds or, or not? How is, is it, you had mentioned earlier that um, one bird species, the pin feathers come out and then, you know, five hours later, they're like totally different. 
How how is it painting yeah. baby birds? What's that like? I found um, it, it it took me a while to be able to paint the quills, you know, the the feather shafts, a bird in pin feathers. How do you represent that it, with watercolor? And I found I just practiced and practiced. And so on the very front cover, you see my Western bluebird and you see those little quills. And so I figured out that the only way to make them stand out was to darken in between. So they looked like little quills. Um, and I even have them in the tail feather. So, and it was extremely difficult painting down. And so I, I found different technique, techniques with different brushes. My brushes were so tiny, tiny, tiny brushes and, you, you know, just the technique of that. But then it came to like uh, the herons and egrets, white birds on white paper. <laughs> How do you make those stand out? The, that was very difficult. So they ended up being kind of on the gray side and um, because I had to not just paint these, but edit them, the, edit everything in a software program where I had to white out the back and make the bird stand out on the page. And when I sent them all in, I got them all back and they said, you need to, you need to go to do this and this and this so you can see all the grains, all the pixels that are still showing up as gray and in your background. So that took me hundreds and hundreds of hours just to do the editing and the right size and so forth but painting baby birds is, is very hard um i don't know if you you've seen um uh oh gosh the baby bird book um by sikafus is that in oh, julie pronouncing julie julie, right? julie 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 dickafus love yes i loved her book and i started painting mine before her book came out and I went yeah I can see how she showed the difficulty of going through the stage of you know um I mean it's just really hard to represent a baby bird with watercolor paints but I did it because if I made a mistake then I could correct it whereas oil and acrylics are not forgiving um, but I had to do layers and layers and layers and layers. I basically had to paint watercolors as if they were oils. So I layered and layered and layered and layered. A little bit of the artistic part of it. Um, and oh I matched gosh. colors. Yeah, I, I saved um, our, our, our own intake center. I saved carcasses of baby birds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I matched the colors and I studied them up close and I weighed them and I got all the weights and data from other rehabbers that contributed um, because our science 200 years ago when they were collecting birds and this the um, information and the data back then you know colors are like what's tan to somebody is brown to somebody else is flesh color to somebody else is how do you so in the back of my book i have a color description and it describes the color and they're related to the watercolors that I painted, which match the bird feathers of either live specimen or photograph or whatever I was painting from. And I used at least five different resources for each bird. So a lot of, um, I, I, I like to be accurate. I'm kind of Martha Stewart in that way. I'd like to really be detailed, you know, perfect. And not everything is perfect in here for sure. <laughs> oh my gosh, but it's it is beautiful. It's a beautiful guide. And in addition to your beautiful illustrations, you have some some pretty cool um, photographs that that are that I think are helpful. So you we have a couple more questions and then we're we're getting close to the end of our time together this evening. But um, you have you weren't able to put everything that you wanted or that we might want for you to have put in this book. So you have a companion website. I think Susan's going to put that website link in the in the chat so that folks can can have it's that. Also um, in the book. Yep. The website's so, in the book as well in case you Yes, excellent. So one um, thing before I forget, it just popped in my 
in my brain. Um, I have recently just finished a draft version of uh, a class. It's an online course that anyone can take through National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association. And it, I don't know when it'll be published, but it'll be within this year. It's a, um, I narrate the whole thing and it has a lot more photographs and up close details. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be a minimal about amount of money, but National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, and you can take that course. And then um, it's about the anatomy, behavior, and identification. So, Excellent. yeah, I want to answer more questions. Yeah. So <laughs> we run out of time. <laughs> we've got um, one on um, approaching conversations about um, hybrid birds or birds that are, you know, not um, pure, so to speak. How do you, how do you yeah. deal with those? The only way that I addressed them, I didn't paint any hybrids and I didn't, but I talk about um, at the end of a description, if, if it's a common hybrid and there's a big enough area that two species will, there, there have, you know, there's, um, their areas, ranges overlap significantly. Um, I would mention hybridizes with such and such or, um, and because if I included hybrids in here, it would have been crazy. But um, I've had some difficulties identifying birds online and I swear that there it was a hybrid because it looked like this species and it looked like that species combined, but there was no one, Thing that just you know stood out so i think hybrids are more common than we think they are out there and they really stump us um even adults you know but babies oh my gosh you know for sure so anyway at the end of my description it might mention it hybridizes with so and so so um thank you linda and we have a another um comment thank you for your book it's always a challenge to identify chicks. I hope that one day you will have a book <laughs> for species in Mexico and Central America. And- um, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I would love that. I would love that. And you said that you studied. Did you, you, did you went to Central or South America to study birds? Is that, do I remember yeah, that I correctly? Yeah, I went to Serena. Serena. Suriname, South America. Well, it used to be Dutch Guyana. And I, um, yeah, I, I hiked with an ornithologist. We studied the Guyana and Cock of the Rock, um, but we were there just to, to actually get breeding bird information on the calf bird, which, uh, and I, I just saw, I saw over 300 species of birds and just went crazy. Rare birds that uh, some people never see. Sat in there and got stung by everything and bit by everything and Saw nine species of monkey and it was fantastic. But, um, you know, bird, those birds are nesting. It's really hard to find that information. And it would be a lot of guesswork. It would, I think it would have, I would not live long enough to be able to produce those books. But what I could do is concentrate on a family and do the family, uh, do one family at a time, maybe not try to encompass all you know the species in the world so yeah yeah well you certainly covered a lot of territory and and i love the way that you um well i love the artwork and i've been watching the baby birds in my neighborhood and and it, you know I, I looked at your book and i'm like man that right on the the descriptions are right on but one of the things that you i think you do very well in your book is really talk about the care, you know, identifying, and then how do you take it? How, how do you take that next step? And are trucial or I mean, you know, you you really um, focus on the things that we need to know when we're thinking about how do yeah. we, um, you know, take care of these birds or, you know, what do what what are our next steps that we have to do, and um, there, yeah, there are a couple books out that um, are real detailed on how to care for them in captivity, and I I brush on that. Um, but it's a temporary care, 
um, which is crucial to get before you can find a rehabber. And so, yeah, the I provide some little care tips throughout because there are things I learned that are really helpful for rehabbers. Yeah. You know what might be fun, and I don't, maybe this is on your website that I haven't had the time to explore a whole lot, but, um, you know, those kinds of tips, like, you know, the fast top 10 or something. So in the uh, last few minutes that we have, what's, we? I'm not seeing um, additional questions um, from our audience, but folks can reach out through you through fa Facebook or visit your website. Email me. And or yeah, email you. email is, uh, and it's on, it's on the website, my email address. I'm always happy to answer. Great. Or, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to even text, text me at, I'm on Facebook, find me on Facebook, friend me, and I will, I will work two, three hours on an ID for you. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So what advice do you have for, um, what advice do you have for folks who are are thinking about rehabilitating or already rehabilitating? What's your what do you want to leave us with? What's your your message? Set your limits. You can, I mean, you from the beginning set a limit because um, we're we're so few and far between, and it, it's really really great work. It's very rewarding. That you have to set limits because you know i would go i would joke about it but it's like did i take a shower this week um you know it, it just got overwhelming to because i had birds in the bathroom i had birds in the kitchen i had birds upstairs and they were everywhere so you have to set a limit as to what you can do and still have your own life uh, and not have a stress level that goes through the roof uh mid-may and mid-june when the peak of the breeding season is so set your limits and keep your personal health going. Yeah, yeah. So we said earlier that you didn't, it couldn't include everything in your book. You've given us a lot of great advice tonight, a lot of great comments and thoughts and things for us to um, look forward to reading your book if we haven't already read the book. And then your website covers things that you weren't able to put into the book because you just ran out of room. So um, thank you so much, yeah. Linda, for joining us tonight. Um, this is in, an incredibly awesome book. And folks, if you haven't already ordered it or read it, or you know somebody, even a local nature center that might benefit from this book, um, highly recommend that you, you um, take a look at it and, and make it as a purchase and gift it to yeah. somebody. I have some sign, I have some copies still that if you want to sign copy, just Email me, I take Venmo, and I'll give you a, a, a great deal on uh, through Environment for the America <laughs> Bird Book Club. <laughs> Excellent. So, Thank yeah, you just so much, Linda. I can tell you all the details. Thank you. Yeah, and I really thank you, thank everybody, you for much. joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining us, and we will look forward to seeing people next, uh, next month in the middle of the day, so depending on what your schedule's like, for uh, Miriam Darlington's book, The Wise Hours. Thank you again, Linda. You are such an asset, valuable information, and um, my best to you. And I look forward to having future conversations with you via text and email and, and your, your social media. So thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you again. Good night. You. We are going to stop recording.